we're going to be looking at 1 John <clears throat> chapter 2 again today. We're actually going to conclude chapter 2. So if you make your way to that portion of Scripture, I'm going to read a few verses that we've already covered for the sake of continuity and context. Our main text today will be verses 28 and 29. Hear the words of the living God beginning in verse 18. Little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard, the Antichrist is coming. Even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They, the Antichrist, went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out, that they might be made manifest, which means clear, revealed clearly, that none of them, those who've departed, were of us. But you, in contrast to those who depart, he speaks to believers, but you have an anointing from the Holy One. That's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it and that no lie is of the truth. He who is a liar or who is a liar, but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. Therefore, let that abide in you which you heard from the beginning, meaning from an apostle, directly from John. If what you heard from the beginning abides in you, you also will abide in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise, that he has promised us eternal life. These things I have written to you concerning those who try to deceive you. But the anointing which you have received from him, that is the filling of the Spirit, the anointing you have received from him abides in you, and you do not need that anyone teach you, meaning anything new, but as the same anointing teaches you concerning all things and is true and is not a lie, and just as it has taught you, you will abide in him. And now, little children, abide in him. That when he appears, speaking of the second coming, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And you know that he is righteous. You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. And these are the words of the living God. Amen. You may be seated. John was there. He was there in the upper room with Jesus on that night. That night on which Jesus was betrayed, arrested, tried, convicted, condemned to death, and then the next day, crucified. It was on that night in the upper room with the disciples that Jesus not only ate the Last Supper, but by doing so also inaugurated the sacrament of the Lord's Supper, which we continue as Christians to observe to this day. It is on that night in the upper room that Jesus spoke some of the most important words he spoke while walking on this planet. Words so important, I don't know if you've ever thought about this, words so important that they take up chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 of the Gospel of John. Words we call the upper room discourse. In the center of those chapters, chapter 15, Jesus spoke of abiding in him. We read some from that chapter as we began the service today. It doesn't take a genius to, to figure out that those words impacted John. They impacted John's thinking. John's gospel, which is the last of the four gospels to be written, probably written somewhere between at, at, at the earliest 30, but maybe 
later, as, as late as 60 years after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. John is the only gospel writer. This is why I say these words must really have affected him because John is the only gospel writer to include this section of Jesus' life and ministry about the up in the upper room with the exception that a couple of the others mentioned the Lord's Supper. But this whole upper room discourse all these years later, and of course, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, all these years later, they were still right there in John's mind. Very important. They clearly impacted his heart and his mind. And think of the context of this second chapter of 1 John. John has just instructed us regarding the truth about those, listen, about those who've departed and that's in stark contrast, the antithetical opposite of those who what? Abide. It's like John is saying there's two groups of people when it comes to this. There's those who depart, and there are those who abide. And then after that, when, after writing the, the Gospel of John, in 1 John and in 2 John, the last living apostle, which is John, writes of abiding. It's still on his, on his mind. He heard Jesus talk about the importance of abiding, and all these years later, at, the, at least 30, possibly closer to 60 years later, he's still thinking about it, and he's still passing those words on to the others of the disciples. He talks about abiding. In 1 John, he talks about it five different times. And then he talks about it once more in 2 John. Clearly, as I said, and I want to, I'm beating on this drum because I want you to remember this throughout the message. These words about abiding impacted John. They impacted him. What does John say about them who depart as opposed to those who abide? He says about those who depart, none of them were of us, meaning they were really never saved. In verse 28, which is the first of our two verses in our text this morning, John again calls us little children. I say again because he refers to his, his readers nine times in this short book as little children. Little children. And what does he exhort? We who are little children in Christ, he exhorts us to abide in him. Look at verse 28. Now, little children, abide in in him. This is in stark contrast to those who depart. And of course, the him, we know who the him is. It's Jesus. Abide in Christ. It's not abide just merely in the teachings. It's not abide merely in the religion. It's not abide merely in, in the things that go along with Christian. No, abide in him. Everything that we do and think and are as Christians is about Christ Jesus. He's the center. He's the center. I want to ask and answer four questions this morning from these two verses, verse 28 and 29. I'll tell you what the questions are. The first one is, what does it mean to abide in Christ? The second one is, how does one abide in Christ? The third is, why abide in Christ? And the fourth is, what is the proof that one is abiding in Christ? So let's talk about the first one first. If you're jotting down notes, what does it mean to abide in Christ? And the answer to this I'm going to give you in two phases. Here's the first. Here's the first, and this is, this is, of course, the absolute most important, which is why it's first. If you're jotting down notes, you have to be in him if you're going to abide in him. You can't abide in Christ if you're not a believer. You cannot abide in Christ if you're not saved. You cannot abide in Christ if you've not been born again by the Holy Spirit. You can't abide in Christ unless you're trusting in Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. And in case you don't know what that means, I'll just give a parenthetical few words here about what does it mean to be born again? What does it mean to be one of his, to be in Christ? Listen, it starts with this. God is holy, and he demands holiness of those who he created in his image. That's all human beings. Secondly, every person is born sinful. And then we prove it every day of our lives, the way we live. Before God, who is holy, we are sinful because we break his laws. Therefore, every one of us deserves God's just 
judgment and condemnation, which he cannot withhold because he is holy and because he is just. Listen, if God didn't do what God must do, God wouldn't be God. It's so important. The good news is, of course, as we say so often, God is not only a just judge, and it is good news that he is, but it's also even really much more exciting news for us personally, is it not, that he's also a loving father. He's not just waiting to slam the gavel down and send all humanity to perdition. Rather, he sent his son, Jesus Christ. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to be born for us, to live for us, to die for us, to rise for us, and to ascend back into heaven where he ever intercedes for his people. Listen, he's provided a way that we can be forgiven, and that way is Christ. When Jesus died on the cross, he received every he, he received all of the sin, all of the guilt, and all of the shame for those he came to save. Why did he do that? So that we could receive the perfect love and acceptance of the Father that only Jesus deserves. It's the greatest switcheroo, to use a very technical term, of all time. He takes our place so that we can stand before the Father in Christ. Is there any better news, child of God? Is there any better news than that? To receive the benefits of what Christ has done for us. God requires, I'm going to just give him three things. One, that we acknowledge our sin. We can't be forgiven of our sin unless we acknowledge our sin. We need to quit denying it, quit rationalizing it, and start confessing it. Secondly, we need to trust in Christ. Believe not only the objective facts about what Jesus has done, but subjectively, listen, believe that his sacrifice is sufficient for your sins. Calling out to God, saying, be merciful to me because of Jesus. And then third, follow him. Follow him as the Lord and master of your life. That's what it means to be in Christ, and you cannot abide in Christ unless you are in Christ. In Christ. So, if you aren't in Christ, can I just redundantly say it? Please acknowledge your sin. Quit fooling yourself. You're not good enough. None of us are. You don't have any, you don't have any agreement with God. The only agreement with God is, is the agreement that you're a sinner and you can only be saved through Christ. That's the only agreement that counts. Don't, don't fool yourself into thinking you're good enough, you're religious enough, you're moral enough. Don't, don't fool yourself into thinking that God is going to is going to allow you into heaven because you're just basically good and somehow getting better. None of that's true. Confess your sin, trust in Christ, and follow Christ as the Lord. And I want to stop right here in this sermon, and I want to pray. Father in heaven, I pray for any who would be hearing these words, who have not trusted Christ, who have not been born again, and I plead with you that you, Holy Spirit, would do the work of regeneration that only you can do. And that that would be evidenced in people's lives as they acknowledge their sin, trust in Christ, and follow him. Father, please. And Father, we who are born again, may we be reminded that that was a work of your Holy Spirit. We didn't do anything to earn it or deserve it. But you gave us new life in Christ. Oh, Father, thank you. Thank you. Save those who are lost and grow those who are saved, we pray. Amen. Amen. So once you're in Christ... You can and you must abide in Christ. What does that mean? I told you I had, there's two parts to this answer. What does it mean to be, uh, to abide in Christ? First, you have to be in Christ. Second of all, here's two words that define what it means to abide in Christ. Remain, that's the first blank, two words, remain permanently. That's my favorite definition of what it means to abide. Those two words address both the short-term and the long-term meaning of the word abide. To remain permanently, you know, listen, to remain permanently means you stick close to Christ, A, and B, you never leave. Stick close to Christ and never leave. You see, some appear to be devoted to Christ, maybe even radically devoted to Christ, but it doesn't last. That's not abiding. That's not abiding. Others are very consistent over the long haul, and they're consistently lackadaisical. They're consistently not very devoted. That's not abiding in Christ either. Abiding in Christ is to, is to remain, to stick close to Christ permanently. That means never leave. 
It means that you are in Christ and that you are going to remain permanently in Christ. Listen, no matter what, through thick and thin, forever, without end. You know, this, this business, not that you hear this anymore, but I used to, used to hear people talking, well, you know, give, give, give Christ a chance. Give, give Christianity a try. You know, this isn't like a new product on the shelf that says, try me. This is surrender your entire life and burn your bridges because there's no retreat. We're going with Christ and we're never going back. That's what it means. That was, that's what it means. Okay, so that's what does it mean to abide in Christ? How about question number two? How does one abide in Christ? Now, there's sure to be many, many other ways, but I figured a sermon can only be so long. So I'm going to just point out four, and they may not be all of them, the four that you might readily think of. So first one, how do you abide in Christ? A, abide in His Spirit. In verse two, in chapter 2, verse 27, John reminds us that we are anointed. We have this anointing of the Holy One. That's referring to being indwelt, to being sealed, to being kept by who? By the Holy Spirit. As we are in Christ, as the Holy Spirit is in us, sealing us and keeping us, we need to abide in the Spirit. Just as we cannot come to faith in Christ except by the regenerating power of the Holy Spirit, listen, neither do we have any hope, listen, we have no hope of remaining permanently unless it's by the Holy Spirit. He's got to keep us. He's got to keep us, and He does. He does. The good news is that the same Holy Spirit who saves us and who places us in Christ does indeed empower us to abide in Christ. Even in those days, even in those weeks, maybe months, for some, maybe it's even seasons, I hope not, even in those periods of time when you may feel like it's, there's, where's, the, where's the fireworks? Where's the, where's the excitement? How come the hairs on my arm don't stand up when I think about Jesus, you know? Listen, it's not about an emotional high that is perpetuated. It's about a commitment to follow Jesus, even when things are, are, they feel rotten. We've got to make sure that we get that. We get that. We need to abide in Him. Here's the second one. How does one abide in Christ? First, abide in His Spirit. Second, abide in His Word. Abide in His Word. Now, here's the one I'm sure that all of you would have said, yeah, we've got to be in the Word. And you're right. We've got to be in the Word. Jesus said in John chapter 8, I love these words, if you abide in my Word, He's speaking to Jewish people who believed in Him. If you read the chapter, you'll see. If you abide in my word, you will be my disciples indeed. In other words, he's speaking to some people who were Jewish people who did believe in him. He goes, okay, now you want to find out if it's real? If you abide in my word, then you'll be my disciples. What does it mean to abide? It means to remain permanently. We need to be people of the book. We need to be people of the word. In John chapter 15, verse 7 and 8, which we just read as we began the, surf, the service this morning, if you abide in me, Jesus says, and if my words abide in you, they go hand in glove. Abiding in Christ and abiding in his word and his word abiding in us, it all goes together. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. I want to stop there just for a moment just to say, if your prayer life isn't everything that it should be, no hands, but all of us could raise our hands to that, right? Listen, one of the most important things we can do for our prayer lives is to abide in the word. Because what does Jesus say? If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask. It, it's a prompting for prayer as we abide in the word. But he doesn't stop there. He not only says you will ask what you desire, he says it'll be done for you. Why is that? Because if we're abiding in his word, we're going to be praying according to his will. People who are abiding in his word don't silly up their prayers with help me win the lottery. People who are abiding in Christ are saying, God, make me more like Jesus. Help me to be a better servant to my to my brothers and sisters in Christ, we, we want more than just the world's goods, so to speak. So he says, if, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. By this, he says, by what? By abiding in him and his word abiding in us and being people of prayer. 
who pray according to God's will. By this, my Father is glorified. What's the purpose for your being and mine? To glorify God. To glorify God above all things. No matter what else anybody tells you, the purpose of your life is this or is that or something else. The purpose of your life is to glorify God. That's why he made us. Now, we get a lot of benefits and wonderful things that go along with that that we can enjoy. But as soon as we start saying, the purpose of my life is for me to be happy, wrong. The purpose of your life is that God would be glorified. And it is true, you will never be happier in a spiritual sense than if you are glorifying God. But your purpose isn't to be happy. Your purpose isn't to be wealthy. It isn't to be healthy. It's to, be, it's to glorify God. That's why he says, if you do these things, you, my Father is glorified, and here it is, and so you'll be my disciples. In other words, you want proof that you're really a Christian? This is it. Abide in Christ. His word abide in you. Have a prayer life. Pray according to his word and seek to glorify God. By the way, why am I talking about John chapter 15 when our text is 1 John chapter 2? Because as I told you at the beginning, I believe those words in the upper room with Jesus so impacted John that here we are at least 30, if not 60 years later, and he's still thinking of those words and telling us in, in different ways, but telling us the same thing. Jumping to a completely different passage, Hosea chapter 4, verse 6. This is another one that's worthy of memorizing. My people, says the prophet, my people are destroyed. What, because of the economy? Because of the health of the people physically? Because of political problems? No, my people are destroyed for a lack of knowledge, the prophet says. And then he tells us what kind of knowledge. Because you have rejected knowledge, I will reject you from being priest for me, being my representatives, because you have, now this is synonymous with have forgotten, uh, have rejected knowledge. He says, you have forgotten the law of your God. And understand, to the Old Testament believer, the law was the word. What is our problem? Most of all, we forget the law of God or the word of God. And then God says, so also I will forget your children. Now, I'll tell you what, if you're a parent, you know what I'm going to say here. There isn't anything in this life that's more important in your life than your children and your grandchildren following Christ. You know, sometimes we like to say, well, you know, they're doing great in business and they're married and they got a big house and they're doing financially well and they're, they're happy. You know, all of that is good and we are grateful. Are they in Christ? Now, I don't say that to tell those of you whose children are not walking with the Lord that, you're, that you've blown it and you're losers. No, 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 no. You keep praying. Never give up praying for your children. Never give up praying for your grandchildren. God will save his people. Amen. He will save them. We don't know exactly know when, how, or who. But we have the confidence that Jesus came to save his people from their sins, and he will, even if we don't see it yet. Amen? That's the most important thing. So when the prophet Hosea thunders these words, because you've forgotten the law of your God, you've neglected and rejected the knowledge of the word, God says, I will forget your children. I don't know about you, but my, my response is, no, God, anything but that. Anything but that. But what is it that starts this ball rolling in that direction? Not abiding in the word. Not being people of the book. Dear friends, I tell you, I believe this with all my heart, that the number one reason why so many believers are not experiencing any joy in their salvation, the number one reason why believers lack discernment is that so many believers do not know the word. I have, I have yet to meet any people who are legitimately claimed to be believers who would say, I don't believe the word. You see, what, what, do you, what do you think about the word of God? It's the word of God. You believe it's true? All of it. It's infallible. It's authoritative. Do you know what's in it? No. No. You know, to abide in his word, to remain permanently in his word is what we need to be about. How often when we are aware of what God requires of us as believers, I'm speaking of those of us who do know the word. We're aware of what God requires of us as believers and instead of obeying his word, we dismiss it. 
We rationalize our disobedience. Why? Because it's not enough to hear it if we don't also heed it. We need to abide in His Spirit if we're going to abide in Christ. We need to abide in His Word if we're going to abide in Christ. Here's the third one. As I said, I'm going to give you some this time that are not what we would normally think of possibly, but we need to abide in the sacraments. Jesus left only two sacraments for His church. It's an error to think there's seven or 13 or 47 or whatever else anybody comes up with. There's two. Baptism and the Lord's Supper. I'll just take them one at a time. How sad that so many believers are not baptized. I mean believers. And I'm not even challenging whether or not they are believers. They're believers, but it's just not important. He left us two sacraments, also known as ordinances. And if you call it an ordinance, it means it's a command, and it is. Why are so many believers not baptized? And don't, and, and don't think it matters. It does matter. How can we think we're abiding in Christ if we disobey the initial commandment? You remember what Peter said at Pentecost when, when the people were cut to the heart by the preaching of the gospel, and they said, men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter answered to them and said, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Christ, the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins. This is what we need to do. How can we say we're abiding in Christ if we're like, well, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't really want to get baptized. And what about the Lord's Supper? I say there's two sacraments. A couple of questions on the Lord's Supper. Are we receiving the supper as often as it is, as it is administered? I know we live in a difficult time in these days, so many cannot come to church, and we, we realize that we believe from Scripture that, that the sacrament of the Lord's Supper is to be administered when the body is gathered. Now, when someone is sick or in the hospital or something like that, we take communion individually to those people. Uh, um, but generally, the Lord's Supper is to be administered to, to the body of Christ when we're together. As often as you... As often as you are together, the, the apostle writes about the scripture, writes about the sacrament. Are we doing that? Are we doing that? And then secondly, how well do we understand what the supper is all about? We've been, we meaning, I've been the writing and then I've been bouncing things off of the other elders. And we've finally sort of settled on uh, rewriting one position paper about understanding the sacraments. It's not changed dramatically, but there are some important changes in it. And then there's another, another booklet that we had uh, that was called Children and Youth and Baptism or something like that. We totally, I started to revise it and I just threw it away and started over. And the reason why is because the question, when should my child be baptized and or receive the Lord's Supper is not the right question. It's online. I'm not going to tell you what the right question is or what the answer is. I really encourage you to read both of those booklets. They're both online. And uh, just go to the position papers at our church's website, and you can read them there. They're newly updated just as of this week about the importance of the sacraments and knowing who should receive baptism and who should receive the Lord's Supper. Listen, do we want to be biblical, or do we just want to do what we've always done? I'm thinking biblical. I'm thinking biblical. Well, enough of that commercial. Now back to our regularly scheduled programming. Friends, listen. To abide in Christ means to abide in the sacraments, not to be saved. Not even to stay saved. But as a means of abiding in Christ because by His grace, Christ has saved us. Amen? That's what this is about. Here's a fourth one. I said that I was just going to give you four. Number D there is abide in his church. In the spirit, in the word, in the sacraments, and in the church. John has already said it, and he will say it several times more before 1 John is finished. We cannot say we love God if we do not love the brethren. And let me just tell you, an incorrect way of understanding love the brethren is, yes, I do. I have a certain group of people who I'm very close to who are Christians, so I love the brethren. No, that's loving your friends. And what did Jesus say about those who love their friends? Even the Pharisees do that. 
Loving the brethren means loving people who some of us are less lovely than others. And if you notice, if you're just listening, you can't see this, but I made a hand gesture pointing to myself. Some of us are not always that lovely. The fact that anybody comes to this church a second time just reminds me that God is good. It's not a reference to a handful of believers who we're very close to. It's a reference to the church. He saves us, and he immediately places us in the body of Christ. And I've said it before, but I'll never cease saying it. He puts us in the body of Christ so that we can learn to love others the way Christ loves us. He doesn't love us because we're lovely, because we're his best friends. He loves us because he's loving. And he tells us to love one another as he has loved us. And how is that? It's not based on who we're chummy with. It's based on who's in the body of Christ. And in particular, that's what local churches are because we can't have personal, intimate relationships with every Christian in the world. We don't know hardly any of them compared to how many there are, but we do have local churches. And listen, God puts us in local churches, and I'm just looking around and saying, you know what? I love the fact that we're not all the same. And it's also an opportunity for us to love the brethren. That's how we abide. And I'll just add this. There's two reasons why I believe believers do not become members of their churches. You ready? There's nothing to jot down, but if you want to write it down, you can. One is they don't get it. What do I mean by that? They put off church membership because they don't get how important a commitment to the local church is. Because if they did get it, they wouldn't put it off. Secondly, you ready for this? The first is that they don't get it. The second reason why a lot of people do not become believers is because they do get it. They get that it means accountability, and they don't want that. We need both. We need both of those to get, get these things straightened out. If you're not a member of your church, and I say this to anybody who happens to be looking online as well, listen, somebody said, it's not profound, but it's true. Somebody has said, if, if, if you're not a member of your church, become a member of your church. Submit yourself to your leaders. Love your, your family and your local church. And if you say, I can't do that because I don't agree with them theologically, then find one that you do. And by the way, if you're looking for a church that agrees with you on everything, you will just stay home and have church by yourself. Because being a part of the church means we don't all agree on everything all the time, and that's okay. We agree on the fundamentals. We agree on what is, uh, what is the gospel and on Christ, and that's what we need to agree on. And beyond that, it's an opportunity to love. It's an opportunity to love. Well, so I say, if you're not a member of the church, which is it for you? Is it because you don't understand it or because you do? I said there are other ways to describe what it means to abide in Christ. We could say prayer. We could say evangelism. We could say a lot of things, and those are all true and good. But I've just given you four basics of how to abide in Christ. Abide in his spirit, abide in his word, abide in the sacraments, and abide in his church. Roman numeral three, why abide in Christ? Why abide in Christ? Well, again, there's many reasons. But the one that John gives us here in this text, in verse 28, is a real good one. Why do we abide in Christ? And I think this is in your notes, because Jesus is, here's the blank, coming again. Jesus is coming again. By the way, as I told you when we talked about that a couple weeks ago, people in the first century, Christians in the first century, thought that Jesus was coming back in their time. And it's good that they thought that. Did he come back in their time? No, but it's good that they thought that. And true Christians ever since have been excited. Maybe the Lord could come. The Lord could come. The Lord could come. Yes, he could. He could come today. He could come before the sermon's over. He could come before he, you lovebirds get married. What a bummer for you. <laughs> Listen, he could come at any time. And the fact that he could come at any time is one of the greatest motivators for us to abide in Christ so that we're ready when he comes. We're ready. When, James Montgomery Boyce, one of my favorite preachers now with the Lord, he said these words. He wrote these words. The second coming of Christ is mentioned 318 times in 260 chapters of the New Testament. Let me say those numbers again. 318 times in 260 chapters of the New Testament. That means more than once per verse on average. Interesting. It is mentioned, Boyce goes on, in every one of the New Testament books with the exception of Galatians and the very short books of 2 John, 3 John, and Philemon. I wrote my notes here. Hmm. Maybe that means something. The second coming of Christ is very important. 
Verse 8, verse 28 says, those who abide in Christ may have confidence and not be ashamed that is coming. Now, what does that mean? Well, it could mean two things. And I'll tip you off at the beginning here. I think it means both of them to some degree or another. I don't think we need to you know, divide the body of Christ over which, which uh, of these two it means. But listen, whether Christ comes in, during our lifetime or not, he is going to come for every single one of us when we die. True? For some people, the second coming has already happened because he came and done got them. Right? And it was him that did it. People don't die because of the devil. People don't die even because of their own stupidity. People don't die because of bad luck. People die because God ordains the hour and the moment of our deaths. And when he comes for us, he's come for us. But if we are in Christ, whenever he comes for us, we'll be saved. However, John does warn that we don't want to be ashamed that is coming. And it seems like he's still talking to Christians. So what is he referring to? Is it possible that this shame, and I'm giving you one of two options here, is it possible that this shame refers to believers who didn't abide in Christ with very much fervency, they were living a lackluster life in Christ, and will not have a loss of salvation, but their lifestyle will result in a loss of reward at his coming? Hmm. Could be. Could be. It may be that, that he's talking about, that Christians are going to be like, wow, I was saved, but man, I sure wish I could go back and live my life a little differently. Or in the context, here's another idea of what it means, could mean, in the context of drawing lines between those who depart and those who abide, uh, it may be that John is saying that those who do not abide are those who depart, and therefore what? were never saved in the first place. Is this about those who thought they were believers but end up finding out otherwise when it's too late? Like those in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21, where Jesus says, On that day many will come to me and say, But Lord, Lord, and I will tell them, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. Is it referring to that? You know, that is going to happen to some people. We know because Jesus said, and he not only said it's going to happen, he said it's going to happen to many. It's a scary thought. Is that what John is talking about here? These people will shrink away in shame and find out they're lost? Or is it about believers whose lives are not marked by abiding and will be saved but suffer loss of reward? Because that too is going to happen. That too is going to happen. May I say to, to these the Christian life is not about saying, how far can I be from Christ and still be saved? The Christian life is not how much sin can I enjoy and still go to heaven. No, the Christian life is saying, how close to Jesus can I remain? It's about abiding in Christ, about remaining permanently. I would say that those, there are people who may have a measure of shame when the rewards are handed out and realize, wow, I really didn't live this very thoroughly. I really didn't abide in Christ. You know, and to those who say, well, I don't care if I'm a rock in heaven so long as I'm there. You will if you're a rock in heaven. Here's the fourth one. What is the proof that one is abiding in Christ? What does verse 29 say? If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. So the answer, what is the proof? The proof is righteousness. This is another evidence and therefore an assurance of salvation. Remember, God wants us to know. He wants us to know if we're believers. And in this passage, practicing righteousness in verse 29 is synonymous with abiding Christ in verse 28. It's just the way that sentences are laid out. It's abiding in Christ and practicing righteousness. The two go together. Christ is righteous, and I'm sure we would all say amen to that. But know this, as we abide in him, we will become more righteous as he is righteous. Note that when John mentions the second coming, he connects it with practicing righteousness. So those who abide in Christ and practice righteousness are not doing this passively. They're not just passively waiting for Christ to return. No, they're actively 
seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And that way, there's no need for shame or, or any embarrassment at the Lord's coming. And I just want to throw this in. It doesn't really fit into the flow, and I even thought about taking this paragraph out, but then I thought, no, it's true. I want to say it. John speaks of practicing righteousness, not just about preaching righteousness. You know, it's one thing to talk about righteousness. It's one thing to lament about how unrighteous the world is. It's another thing to say, God, make me more righteous as Jesus is righteous. It's another thing to say, please, let me grow in Christ and be more like him. That's called pursuing righteousness. And guess what? That's the same thing as abiding in Christ, according to John. And we do, where do we seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness? Well, when we're reading the Bible or praying or at church. Well, that's a good place to start. But we need to be practicing righteousness in all of our lives, at work, at school, at play, in the neighborhood. We need to practice righteousness in our homes. It's amazing how many things, uh, as a young guy, I was like in my, well, I guess I was still in my 20s, yeah, mid-20s. And Francis and I were teaching children's church at the church we went to. It was a big enough church. They had more than one service, and, and they had a church time for the kids. And uh, we, we were on that. And it's amazing how many things that uh, <laughs> some of the children were just, my daddy uses the F word, you know. It's like, oh, great. Your dad's one of the deacons, you know. <laughs> I won't even tell you. But you know what? Practicing righteousness doesn't mean you're perfect at home. Nobody is. But, you know, what are, what are, we, what are our kids thinking when they see us? And then you never know what they're saying when they're not seeing us, <laughs> telling other people about us. We need to practice righteousness in our homes. This happens as we abide in Christ. And what motivates a true commitment to abide in Christ? What motivates a true commitment to seek Him first, to seek the Lord and His righteousness above all things? The grace of God, the kindness of God, the love of God. How about the patience with God? Listen, I will say raise your hand. Has God been patient with you this week? You know, the patience of God is such a motivator to say, oh God, you've, you've you still have your hands on me, even after I said that or did the other or thought yet another. Those things motivate us to want to abide in Christ. Well, let me conclude with the way I began. John was there. He was there. He was there in the upper room. He heard those words that take up several chapters of the Gospel of John which in the center of those words is John 15, which is all about abiding. And here he is, at least 30, possibly 60 years later, and he says, little children, he's old now, little children, abide in him. Abide in him. You know, my, my last statement, and it's there for your, to fill in the blanks if you want, just, we'll just close by saying this. Will these words mean to us, even a fraction of what they meant to John. That's, that's what I came away from this with. Lord, I want to be as gripped by these words, abide in Christ, as John was. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this time to be in your word today. We're so grateful, Lord, for John, for his abiding in Christ, to being the last of the apostles after there was all the rest were gone. And here he was still going forward in his 90s probably. Father, thank you. And may we be like him in his pursuit of the one who we really want to be like, who is Jesus. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.